In order to understand the chemistry of EDTA, we first have to look at the structure of our chelating agents. So EDTA is a long organic molecule that consists of two types of organic functional groups, carboxylic acids, four carboxylic acid groups, here, here, and here, and two amine groups, here and here. So in general, we have four acidic organic functional groups and two basic organic functional groups. As a result, there are six points in the molecule where the EDTA molecule can be protonated. Four protons that can be removed from the carboxylic acids and two amine groups which can pick up protons. So the overall structure of EDTA is relatively complex and in between the functional groups you have CHT group, CH2 groups that give a little bit more flexibility, conformational flexibility to the molecule and allow it to wrap up and encase metal ions. Because of the relative complexity of the structure, EDTA is rarely referred to by its chemical formula in balanced chemical equations. Again, as we've seen before, analytical chemists in particular want to gloss over some of the actual structural complexity of the molecule and just focus on what it does. So in general, particularly in the Harris textbook and in analytical chemistry resources, you'll see this molecule, EDTA, represented simply as Y, where Y indicates all the structure of EDTA that are not ionizable protons. So if you have the fully protonated form of EDTA like this, this structure of EDTA would be abbreviated as H6Y2+, where you have six removable protons, four at the carboxylic acid groups, two at the amines. As a result, you can use this notation to abbreviate each successive deprotonated form of EDTA, where if you remove one of the six ionizable protons, the molecule becomes abbreviated as H5Y+, if you remove two protons, abbreviated as H4Y, and so on. The fully deprotonated form of EDTA is actually the form that will bind most effectively to metal ions, and we abbreviate it simply as Y4-, which is the fully deprotonated form of EDTA, no protons on the carboxylic acids, no protons on the amine groups, and then you have four oxygens with lone pairs ready to donate to a metal center, and two nitrogens with lone pairs ready to donate to a metal center. And so the Y notation is commonly used to summarize and abbreviate the structural complexity of EDTA. So when you see Y used in the complex metric titration context, it stands for EDTA and fully deprotonated EDTA, the, type, the e form of EDTA that will bind to a metal center is Y4 minus. Now, each of these ionizable groups has a different pKa. The first pKa of EDTA is one of the carboxylic acid groups, and the first carboxylic acid group will be deprotonated at pH equal to zero. The last amine group won't be deprotonated, however, until about pH of 10.4. At 10.4, that's when the Y4 minus form of EDTA truly becomes the primary EDTA species present in solution. That doesn't mean, as we will see, that the pH of your solution has to be higher than 10 for EDTA to function as a chelator. Le Chatelier's principle will actually act in EDTA's favor and favor the ionization, the removal of these protons as EDTA starts to bind to a metal center. And if a metal center, a metal ion, is around to be bound by this ligand, that will assist in kicking off the hydrogens and effectively lower the pKa at which these protons are removed because you have a competitive process where the lone pairs on the Lewis base portions of the molecule will bind the metal center, assisting in removal of the protons. But what that does mean is that, as we'll see, most complex metric titrations are run between about pH 6 and about pH 10.5, depending on the metal. When EDTA binds to a metal center, as we said, it binds through six different groups, the four carboxylic acid groups and the two amine groups, and the conformational flexibility of the molecule allows it to bind in an octahedral geometry around most metal centers. You may not have used the term octahedral a lot since you talked about molecular geometry in Gen Chem 1, 
What that essentially means is that the EDTA molecule will wrap itself around the metal ion in such a way that there are 90 degree angles between each of the bonds that form around the metal center. As a result, EDTA binds to metal ions extremely stably and almost irreversibly. And in fact, this can be taken advantage of outside of strict analytical chemistry where EDTA can be used as a therapy for patients who have ingested toxic metals and EDTA can be ingested by the patients to attempt to wrap up some of the metal ions they might have ingested such as lead or lead to or mercury to where the formation constants of EDTA are stronger for those large heavy metal ions than they are for most naturally occurring biologically essential ions like calcium, copper, and iron. However, this is not a perfect therapy. One of the great things about EDTA from an analytical standpoint is that it binds almost irreversibly to any metal ion with a plus two or plus three charge, but this is also a cutting edge sword. Well, it will form complexes, strongly bound complexes to almost any ion, so you can quantify almost any ion using EDTA titration. EDTA is very poorly selective. It will bind to lead 2 or mercury 2 plus at least as strongly as it binds to Ca2 plus or Fe2 plus. And so as a result, you have to go through a rigorous series of procedures, kind of like we started to go through in our hard water titration lab, where at your first pass with an EDTA titration, you can only find out the total metal concentration in your sample, and then you have to selectively remove individual ions from the sample if you want to titrate for a specific ion. So EDTA is a great complexometric titration agent in the sense that it binds very strongly to the analyte, but its selectivity is poor because it binds strongly to any metal cation that has a plus two charge or greater. All right, so, why do we need to run a complexometric titration between about pH 6 and about pH 10.5? One of the challenges in designing complexometric titrations is that you're competing with a number of different factors. EDTA is a hexaprotic acid, and really only the HY, H2, Y2 minus, HY3 minus, and Y4 minus forms are reasonable in terms of their formation constants at binding to metal ions. What this means is if you want to run a complex metric titration, you really need to run it at a pH between about 6 and 10.5 in order to maximize EDTA's ability to bind to the metals. This can be problematic because at higher pHs, metals start to precipitate as metal hydroxides. And particularly, it's not practical to run EDTA titrations at extremely basic pHs, where Y4- minus is the predominant EDTA species, because above pH 12, or even above pH 10.5 or 11, most metals start to precipitate out as metal hydroxides, removing them from the matrix and making them unavailable for binding. So as a result, when designing a complex metric titration, we need to strike a balance between where EDTA is in a chemical form where it will bind to a metal and yet still be below a pH where most of our metals are still free in solution and not precipitated out as metal hydroxides or oxides. As a result, EDTA titrations are generally run in this window and there's a specific pH range that you have to hit depending on which metal you intend to titrate with EDTA. What we're looking at in the left-hand panel is another example of a predominance diagram. So you'll notice there's an alpha on the y-axis of this diagram indicating that the decimal value on the y-axis indicates what fraction of the total EDTA in solution is each specific form, and pH is on the x-axis. So for instance, reading the trace, if we're at running our EDTA titration at a pH of about 6.2, we have kind of a 50-50 distribution between the H2Y2 minus form of EDTA and the HY3 minus form of EDTA. Yet it's the Y4 minus form of EDTA that's actually going to bind to the metals irreversibly. 
And again, the thing to keep in mind is we don't have to have all the EDTA in the Y4 minus form to start the complexation reaction. We just have to have EDTA sufficiently deprotonated that when it starts to bind to the metal center, the metal, the formation of those new bonds to the metal will assist in kicking off the rest of the protons. And by the time the complexation reaction is finished, the Y4 minus form is present and binding to the metal center. So what we're going to do mostly in our lecture next time is show you mathematically how we can plan to differentiate how much of each EDTA species is available at each pH and what that's going to mean for the formation constant. And thus we can judge if it's feasible to run our EDTA titrations for specific analytes at specific pHs. What you'll notice in the figure over here, hopefully, is on the y-axis we have a series of different metal cations that might be analytes. And the bar range shown on the figure here shows you the pH range over which it is feasible to complex specific metal analytes using EDTA. And when we meet next time, we'll talk about why this pH range is the range we have to hit to get good results in our complex metric titration. We talked a little bit about predominance diagrams for monoprotic acids in the previous lecture modules. EDTA also, as you just saw, has a predominance diagram which we can use to predict the speciation of our chelating agent at different pHs. However, the alpha value statement and the algorithm used to calculate the EDTA concentration at different pHs is significantly more complicated than the monoprotic alpha values that we talked about last time. If we talked about the total fraction of EDTA that's in the Y4 minus form, alpha Y4 minus, the fundamental mass balance statement would say that that's the concentration of Y4 minus over the formal concentration of EDTA F, and the formal concentration of EDTA is the concentrations of EDTA in each protonation state summed together. So that's the H6Y2 plus concentration plus the H5Y plus concentration plus the H4Y concentration plus the H3Y minus concentration plus the H2Y2 minus concentration plus the HY3 minus concentration plus the Y4 minus concentration. Huh. That's six possible forms of EDTA at any pH, and that's extremely hard to keep track of even using the pictorial representation of EDTA's predominance diagram. So the last thing we want to do, do today is just remind you of the fundamental meaning of that predominance diagram and give you a quantitative estimate of how much Y4 minus there might be at a reasonably neutral pH aqueous solution. So for instance, if you were asked, what is the fraction of EDTA in the Y4 minus form in a 0 0.10 molar aqueous solution of EDTA, where the pH is equal to 6, one of the first things you might do is pull out the predominance diagram and try to look at pH 6 and see what's there. Well, if you look at pH 6, which is right here, you see that's essentially right at the pKa, which sep of the carboc of the right at the pKa of the groups that separate the H2Y2 minus form from the HY3 minus form. So that's an amine group being deprotonated right here. So you'd be tempted to say, well, that's a 50-50 mixture of the H2Y2 minus form and the HY3 minus form. So the amount of Y4 minus that must be in solution should be zero at this point. And that's an okay qualitative answer, but we can't actually have zero Y4 minus at this point there must be some very small concentration of Y4 minus. So we can't get the number that we're after just by looking at the predominance diagram for once. Instead, we'd have to do a measurement and actually measure out the concentration of all the, spe all the individual species of EDTA at that pH and apply the stricter mathematical definition of the alpha value. So these numbers would have to be given to you. You can't simply read them from a predominance diagram. But at pH 6, an experiment would tell us that for the H6Y2+, the fully protonated EDTA, the concentration of that would be 8.9 times 10 to the minus 20th molar at pH equals 6. 
The next protonation state, H5Y plus, 8.9 times 10 to the minus 14th molar. The neutral molecule, H4Y, 2.8 times 10 to the minus 7th molar. H3Y minus would have concentration of 2.8 times 10 to the minus 5th molar. As we would expect, H2Y2 minus and HY3 minus are the only EDTA species that we'd have meaningful concentrations of. Their concentrations will be 0 0.057 molar and 0 0.043 molar, respectively. The concentration of Y4 minus is measurable at that pH and turns out to be 1.8 times 10 to the minus 6th molar. So if we want to actually figure out the fraction of EDTA in the Y4 minus form, we would have to use the full formal statement of what the alpha value for Y4 minus is and take the concentration of the Y4 minus divided by the total concentration of EDTA. So the alpha value would end up being 1.8 times 10 to the minus 6th divided by 8.9 times 10 to the minus 20th plus 8.9 times 10 to the minus 14th plus 2.8 times 10 to the minus 7th plus 2.8 times 10 to the minus 5th plus 0 0.057 plus 0 0.043 plus 1.8 times 10 to the minus 6th molar. And if you actually crunch the numbers on that fraction, I believe that you'll find that while the concentration of Y4 minus is equal to 1.8 times 10 to the minus 6th molar, the alpha value is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5th. So one molecule out of about every 200,000 is going to be Y4 minus in an EDTA solution with a pH of 6. Now notice once again that doesn't mean that we can't run an EDTA or a complex metric titration at pH 6, but what it does mean is that we have to use some additional mathematical reasoning and arguments to accurately decide how effectively our metal ion will be complexed at pH 6 and decide which metal ions we might be able to successfully analyze for if the pH of the solution is only 6. So that's where we'll pick up when we come back next week, and I hope to see you then.